patriotism, faith, national unity, education, fiscal responsibility, civility, the values that define America. Fascinating stories and talks from America-loving patriots dedicated to preserving freedom, opportunity, and justice. Welcome to the Friends and Fellow Citizens Podcast. And welcome to episode 136 of Friends and Fellow Citizens. I'm your host, Sherman Tylowski. Thank you all so much for listening to this episode. We are in the year 2024. I'm so excited to start another year of podcasting with all of you. And if it wasn't because of all of your support, uh, we would not be here today. And so a big shout out, special thank you to our Patreon supporters. They are absolutely incredible. And for another year of podcasting, this is really, really just something I am so grateful for. We also support, also very much appreciate our listeners. So thank you for subscribing and for listening to this podcast. If you are new to this show, make sure to hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. You can also sign up for our email updates so that you can get your notifications about new episodes right in your inbox. Now, let's get right into our guest episode with our in, the introduction of our guest, Tirza Duran. As ACI's technology director, Tirza writes on a wide variety of technology and regulatory-related issues. Prior to coming to ACI, Tirza worked for the premier policy think tank in Pennsylvania, where she focused on economic and fiscal policy. Tirza brings an interdisciplinary approach to policy, having received her BA in Anthropology from Eastern Oregon University, her MA in International Studies from the University of San Francisco, and having professional experience in economic research departments across various think tanks. All right, well, everyone, I am very happy to welcome Tirza Duran onto our program. Tirza, welcome to Friends and Fellow Citizens. Thank you for having me. Well, let's first talk a little bit about yourself, and we're going to be talking about uh, a bit about consumer protection, about technology, and other issues. Uh, but first, tell us a little bit about how you got interested in the field that you are in right now. I came to public policy through a kind of non-traditional route. I originally studied anthropology in college, and I thought I could kind of travel the world and then solve all of the problems. Um, I was a little naive obviously. Um, But the more I got into that area, the more I experienced kind of a discomfort with a lot of the top-down development policy. Um, And I really saw a lot of policy that kind of sought to preserve this idealized version of other cultures without really respecting the individual choices of the people within them. So I knew that this wasn't really for me. However, I was still interested in the mechanisms through which a lot of these changes were happening, um, which brought me into public policy. I decided to focus on economic policy based on my development background and with the basic philosophy (laughs) Sorry, that if people are, are given the opportunity to prosper economically, then they know best how to meet their own needs. And in today's economy, tech policy is a major part of that. Technology is everywhere. It's how we live our lives. And whether it's access to broadband or learning technical skills to get jobs or even the ability to have remote work, the tech landscape is an increasingly integral part of people's lives. So that's that's how I got into the tech and economic or economic policy. That's interesting. I, I love how people can enter these areas, for, as you said, from non-traditional routes. I think that's what makes uh, Friends and Fellow Citizens so interesting is that we have all these guests who come from these non-traditional routes, because I do think that's where 
a lot of potential for change comes from is when we don't keep doing the same things, we constantly innovate. And I think that's what it's all about. And I want to ask you more about your role as ACI's technology director. I I think this is so fascinating, especially since you're working probably in such a uh, constantly dynamic and ever-changing space. So tell us about your role as the technology director and just some of the things that you think are particularly valuable to best represent ACI in this responsibility. Yes, in my role as technology director, I oversee a great team of analysts and we work on a range of issues. These include antitrust, broadband access, artificial intelligence regulation, data privacy, and just about anything else you can imagine. Um, And then in my work at ACI more generally, one of the things that I really appreciate doing is looking at all of these topics and analyzing them through the lens of consumer impact. Um, There's a quote from Adam Smith that I'm going to probably butcher, but the gist of it is that um, the end goal of all production is the consumer. And so at the American Consumer Institute, more broadly and in tech policy, we really work to focus the policy conversation on what the consumer impact will be. Wow. I mean, really, just especially since we're all so hooked on technology, you know, when I first saw your role as technology director, I thought, okay, first of all, she's probably a lot more tech savvy than I am. <laughs> but second of all, uh, this is such a an interesting policy area because we think of technology as uh, just some, as like a convenience and it, it certainly is, but there's so much more to that. This, and, and you said, we're also thinking about the consumer, like who is buying that, this technology and why are, are consumers buying this technology? And let's move on to, I guess, some of these issues here that that uh, that you've, you've found in your role as very significant. Now, I know there's so many issues and we, we'd be here all day. We've, we could do easily 24-hour podcast episode, uh, <laughs> probably longer than that, uh, if we were to delve into every single issue. But in your view, what are some of the biggest and most salient issues you think are affecting uh, our our federal our federal government, uh, and really just I guess the national priorities as a whole. So, the tech policy space has been really active these last couple of years, um, but there are kind of three main areas that I think have the potential for both a lot of good, but also a lot of harm, depending on how the government goes about it. Um, The first that I want to touch on is the discussion around data privacy. I do think that this is one area where there is some room for congressional action. Um, I think that establishing a federal data privacy standard that eliminates some of the confusion that companies have right now and adds some protections for, for consumers is really important. However, again, it matters how this is done. ACI um, released a policy primer on this issue not that long ago, and essentially the main things that should be accomplished are first and foremost, a respect for consumer choice. Overwhelmingly, consumers choose to share their data with companies like Google or Meta to gain access to different goods and services, and this is a choice. And work can be done to make sure that it's an informed choice, and we can definitely be better about that. But at the end of the day, we do need to respect the decision. And then the next major area would be establishing some consistent rules over how we treat different types of data, the retention of data, and rules around data transfer more broadly. Another area that I'm sure everyone's hearing about um, is AI. It seems to be everywhere these days, although a few people can really define and understand it. Um, But it's another area that we will likely see some legislative efforts in in the near future. ACI also has a policy primer on this topic that essentially argues that many of the harms that people are rightfully concerned about, um, such as discrimination and phone scams, are already largely covered by existing legal protection. Part of my work is really making the case that the best path forward for this technology is to incorporating it or to incorporate it into existing protections. 
um, rather than trying to reinvent the wheel and come up with a whole new legal structure to incorporate this technology. Um, and not to, not to talk too long, but lastly, there's kind of the ever, ever present issue in the tech landscape of antitrust. And here, the main work to be done isn't so much creating good policy, but rather pushing back on a lot of the harmful policy that we're seeing. Without getting too technical, there's basically a lot of proposals and agency actions that are attempting to create policies that target companies for being really big. And at ACI, one of the key principles we support is regulatory fairness, which essentially states that there should be clear standards for behavior that companies need to meet, but that these standards shouldn't be manipulated to harm or benefit one company over the other. So those are kind of the main issues in tech policies that I see that's going on right now and also that will likely continue into the future. That's really helpful for giving us that overview of the landscape, which we're delving into. Let's first tackle something on data privacy. And I'll ask it in kind of in this way, which is data privacy is part of the reason why I think it's so tricky is because it can be it can be so, so linked to, um, to very controversial legislation that that uh, that kind of straddles the line between civil liberties and security. And a classic example, I think, would be the Patriot Act. You know, it's it's one of those more polarizing acts that was implemented in 2001 um, to uh, essentially give more, some more uh, more powers for uh, for the searching of, of private records and things like that. And obviously, uh, in the wake of September 11th, and eventually uh, was renewed uh, multiple times, especially given the the war on terror. And I, I guess I'll ask you in this way, which is just in your view, is you know how how you how do you see this balance between protecting data, but also at the same time recognizing that we that, that there's a certain interest uh, by the authorities to uh, protect to protect the general public by you know being able to access personal data. I mean, how do you kind of see just the general? debate on this idea of of national security and uh, civil liberties and freedom. Yes, that issue of the tension between national security and civil liberties isn't unique to data privacy. We really see it playing out with the AI conversation as well. One of the things that ACI really talked about in its AI primer is separating public as in government use and then private use. Um, When we're talking about a lot of the data privacy conversations, unfortunately, but not surprisingly, a lot of the efforts from the government are to regulate how private companies use data, not so much how they themselves use data. Um, But I think overall, a lot of the same guiding principles can guide both use um, transparency so that people know what's being collected, how it's being used, and informed consent are key key aspects for it. One of the things, this is more in the private use that we really talk about, is that not all data is created equal. We have three major buckets, and I didn't invent this concept, concept but I will repeat it. Um, You have data that users willingly enter into a company or into a platform, right? When I'm signing up for my Facebook account, I put in my name, I put in my age, I put in that data. Then you have observed data where companies can see, oh, I looked at this web page, I clicked on this link, then I went here. Maybe there's a combination. We can make some basic... um, conclusions about what she's interested in or whatever. And then you have what I refer to as derived data, which is you have a bunch of individual data that either a user puts in or that is observed and you can draw your own conclusions from that. And so a lot of the tension right now is who owns each of these types of data. And I think where Congress and lawmakers can add a lot of clarity is really defining who's in charge of each of these types of data, who's responsible for each of these types of data. And I think that'll add a lot of clarity and it allows for the 
embodiment of best practices with respect to consumers, but without completely overhauling how the online economy works. Yeah, that that's a good point that you make about just differentiating the types of data because I think we like to just lump everything, you know, like like the data about, you know, the the birthday party you went to is it can't be the exact same kind of data that that's salient when it comes to like driver's license number, right? And um exactly. I just uh it's it, although sometimes I find it hilarious when I see some of those like um campaign not not political campaign videos, but like um, when there's videos from like the NSA or some other agencies saying like we're not interested and you know your 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 private life or things like that but then you know that that in of itself is like it's going to also scare some people too right because then it's like oh but you mentioned how like oh we're not we're not gonna you know intervene and i just i just bring about the idea that there's also the kind of this i feel like there's this inherent mistrust or distrust in government too where it doesn't matter what what the nsa or any agency say about data it's like there's there's always going to be a lack of trust in um in big companies or in in big government how do you kind of see that play out especially since uh, we've had a lot of discussion about just the the polarization that's been happening in our nation today i think how it's going to play out i'm not going to make a huge prediction what i will say is i think from the private side there is an incentive for businesses to gain consumer trust. I think that can do a lot to alleviate some of the potential for bad actions. There's also existing frameworks that allow companies to be held to account for fraudulent claims about their data practices. The FTC has fined multiple companies this year for falsely advertising that they have these very secure data practices when in fact that wasn't the case. I think you bring in a really good point about a social distrust of kind of data collection because you mentioned the NSA and that was a huge scandal that we were told everything was safe. We're not doing anything weird. We're not doing anything nefarious. And then we found out that wasn't the case. And the FTC can go after private companies for lying about their data practices, but there isn't the same enforcement mechanism with the government. And unfortunately, I think, I think unfortunately for private companies, a lot of the social distrust that is linked to what the government's going to do is going to be blamed on fears for what they believe private companies are doing. And some of that's not mistrust. Um, we've learned recently that the government does intervene with some of these big platforms and ask for certain information. So it's not illogical to have concerns. The bright side is that I do think these companies have an incentive to earn and keep consumer trust. So where I see a big role for kind of more, I'm reticent to say, intervention, but I think the government could do a lot better job of reining itself in and regaining some of its citizens' trust if it's really um, concerned about data privacy and security. Very true. Uh, I, I think one of the things I want to bring up is also with regards to consent. I mean, uh, one of th- like something that everyone has encountered is when they create an account on social media or when they agree to something, when it can almost be any on any entity out there. Uh, there's always this this little checkbox says I agree to you know the the rules or the or whatever agreement there is, and I don't know about you, but I don't know about <laughs> like the long document that you have to to, to click on. But also sometimes when you create files or whatever files, uh, there's there's all there's inherent consent, right? Because because you're basically putting in your information. You're saying I've they might you might not say it out loud but you'd be like i trust that if i give this information i'll get something out of it whatever it is that you're getting uh, but i it seems like a lot of people that just don't want to realize that they are consenting when they create an online profile and all that i'm just wondering if if on the just on the consent and on like data management because sometimes that's something that you mentioned there um i wonder and, and wonder if there's there's anything that you'd like to just add about what what we can do better generally when it comes to informing people about uh, about what they sign up for online, and that it's not it's not one of those simple tasks of just saying, okay, I'm putting my name and my birthday and all that, 
and that there wouldn't be any sort of consequences if something were to happen. I mean, uh, are, is there anything that you know of that, that you think we could do better on in terms of informing or making people aware about what consent means and how that ties to the data management? Yeah, I think that there is a role for greater clarity in this space. Um, so there's kind of two different angles you can approach it with. On the one hand, um, I think these data disclosures or these practices should be readable and understandable without a law degree. So I think there is space to make sure that we're using as simple language as you can while still being correct and communicating the data practices, what you're going to collect, how you're going to use it, how long you're going to have it, whether or not the person consents to it being shared. There's room for clarity and improvement in this space. Unfortunately, for people who want everyone to be a super informed person, I think there also has to be respect for the reality that a lot of consumers will check the box and not read and not care until they learn something retroactively. And that's where I think respect for consumer choice really comes in. Um, Yes, we can make it easier to understand. Yes, we can have best practices. And yes, we can make sure that companies aren't intentionally deceiving their users. But at the end of the day, there isn't a legislative alternative to informed consumer choice and people really having responsibility for the decisions they make. So whatever we do with data privacy and protection, it needs to be balanced with, for lack of a better term, personal responsibility. We we don't want to kind of just admit that it is a responsibility issue. And uh, I, I certainly, I certainly hope that 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 becomes part of parenting. You know, using usage of technology and all that to to be able to uh, to 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 integrate technology with our lives a little bit better. Uh, let's move on to uh, to something that some people might have heard. It's called Section Two Thirty. Again, a lot of this legal jargon. I mean, this there's a reason why I didn't get into law school. <laughs> so, um, it, for I, I've lamented about this a few times on the podcast, but uh, I I still repeat myself just just as like a clear message as to how how people uh, should for for those who are impl- who are going to law school. I 1,000% uh, applaud you for, for getting past me, far beyond me. I didn't even pass the LSAT, for crying out loud. So anyway, <laughs> but uh, let's let's go into the, the Section 230. Um, so Tirza, tell us about kind of not only what Section 230 is in, like, in layman's terms, but uh, really just kind of really the, this, this tension again, because it seems like that's kind of the theme here, which is uh, what, how do you see this tension here between – uh, of you know a publisher right but also this this idea that uh that social media companies are are a bit like a like a unique forum for lack of better terms uh how do you see these kind of dynamics here i want to start by also stating that i have not gone to law school um but i have studied and i have worked on this from a overall policy perspective so that's my disclaimer as well Um, In simple policy terms, (laughs) Section 230 comes from the Communication Decency Act, and essentially it says that platforms cannot be held liable for the content that are posted on their sites. In effect, an impractical example is this means that Instagram is not held responsible for the content that, say, Kim Kardashian posts, because I like to bring the Kardashians into everything. Um, this becomes a political conversation. Well, it doesn't really become political, but it gets dragged into the political conversations because people across the political spectrum, it's not a right or a left issue, um, either believe that the platforms are not blocking enough of the content they don't like or that they're blocking too much of the content they do like or some combination or mixture in the middle. This leads to some policy discussions where people on both sides of the aisle um, really want to work to reform Section 230 and basically promote more content moderation for stuff they don't like and then ban content moderation for stuff they do like. 
From a Section 230 debate, I think it's really important to provide some context for why Section 230 was introduced in the first place. Well, part of why Section 230 was introduced in the first place. And that is because there were two court cases that basically had contradictory results. And I'm not going to get too much into the weeds, but basically in one court case, a platform was held liable for the content on their site because they did some content moderation, although they didn't moderate everything. And then in a different case, I believe an earlier case, a platform was basically said, you're not liable because you don't do any content moderation. So within this context, Section 230 really developed to A, promote platforms from being liable for what people post on their site, but also to allow platforms to do some moderation, albeit imperfectly, and not be held liable if they decide to do some kind of moderation. Um, so I think that's important to note, but especially when you're talking about trying to either force more or less moderation. But I think the other thing that is really interesting and what I think it's easily lost in this conversation is even if you're granting the premise that we should reform Section 230, which I'm not, I don't think we should, but let's grant that premise. There's a practical consideration for who's going to write these rules, who's going to decide what is good, who's going to decide what is bad. Um, Say that there's a law that promotes some platforms from removing content for political reasons. Where would we draw that line? There are some people, I mean, look at, we're not going to get too political, but look at January 6th. Some people would be like, that's not matter. It doesn't, it shouldn't be banned. Some people would be like, that is a clear terrorism act. Um, hate speech is another example. Elon Musk has publicly said that he thinks the term cis is hate speech. Other platforms like Facebook, I think, are pretty unlikely to agree with that. And so even in these areas that should be kind of clear cut, like hate speech or political beliefs, even when we say we should ban hate speech and protect political speech, there is a gray area. And it's that gray area that would be subject to the bias of those writing the laws. And so I think for both sides, before they argue that we need to reform Section 230 or the government should have more power over content, I think they need to consider what could happen if the person they don't want in power is the one who are writing those rules. And so that's what I think we should really focus on within the Section 230 debate. That is really, really important point. It seems and that, that it's just such a recurring theme because everyone wants to feel that they're always, their side is always going to be in power when, in fact, it's never been that case. It's always switched back and forth. And I, I want to – I guess you, bring, you kind of bring up a good – uh, a good follow-up question here, which is just in the grand scheme of things, when it comes to whether it was about data, whether it's about Section 230 or, or or any of the other policy areas that you deal with, how much of this do you think are – how much of the issues do you think is is a result of of a lack of just – I guess for lack of a term, lack of education about these kind of issues for the most part. I mean, I just feel like when when it comes to civics, right, we we have these expectations of holding people accountable, right, and the, or having elections or and doing doing these kinds of democratic norms and practices to to, to uphold democracy, and yet when there isn't, and this is kind of really on the lo- along the lines of what Thomas Jefferson said about you know, having a the, having a well-educated population, if if there isn't an awareness of these kinds of issues, like for example, as you mentioned, right, like the like the, like hate speech, when it comes to hate speech or political talk, things like that, then you can't really advance very very quickly uh, as a society. So how how much of do you do you think these debates are as are a result of of uh, of people not being able to get to a position where they can civilly debate on these on these topics, uh, especially with the polarization that we we are seeing today. I think as a society, we see a lot less communication across party lines. Um, I'm hesitant to say that it's the worst it's ever been because it's been kind of crazy before and we're not in the communism square. So people aren't being, you know, interrogated for that. But I think we've had a, 
a tick in the wrong direction over the past couple of years. And I think a lot of people would agree on that. Um, I also think a lack of understanding about the technical issues is definitely part of a problem. When we're talking about data privacy and even AI regulation specifically, I think there's a lot of unknown about how the technology works, but there's a lot of fear over how the technology works. We brought up the NSA example earlier, and a lot of people were concerned about that. So obviously that would kind of create a knee-jerk emotional reaction for somebody to step in and do something. We have a lot of the AI discussion right now. Unfortunately, all the references that we have in pop culture are Terminator or some horrible movie where all they're seeing are these really horrible things that could happen. And so again, you have a knee-jerk reaction that people should step in and do something. And unfortunately, and it's not just in tech, we see that people are very happy to use the force of government to do things that they want. And then they tend to only want government to be restrained when it starts doing things that they don't want. And I think we play that we see that play out in tech. We really see that in the Section 230 debate. But I think it permeates the policy discussions across all issues. Uh, when it comes to AI, I mean, this is still a new uh, area for me, uh, just trying to get to get to understand and kind of how AI works and everything, uh, or I guess beyond just the technicalities. How do you see AI becoming an increasingly bigger policy area other than the fact that it's advancing uh, so rapidly technologically? So we talked a little about this earlier, and AI really has begun dominating a lot of the tech policy space um, to reference back to a lot of the fear. Uh, there's a rumor going around that part of the motivation for the White House executive order is that President Biden watch some Mission Impossible and got very scared of the AI technology in there. Um, so again, we have a lot of we have a lot of references of negative impacts of AI and we don't have a lot of references for very positive impacts of AI um, yet. But I think like all new technology, any efforts to step in and regulate it should really be limited to established harm. Um, which, again, are a little bit questionable at, as the current state. Um, as far as the economic impacts, I think we can really expect to see a lot of efficiency gains and a lot of streamlining of certain activities and operations. But the big fear and the big risk right now is that we're going to let a lot of hypothetical fears and concerns, or even real fears and concerns, um, allow for the political momentum to stifle innovation um, from the get-go. And when it comes to, I guess, just the effects of AI, because one th one of the things that I'm concerned about is the fact that we will be in the world where we see a video that's purportedly showing, let's say, a member of Congress doing just let's just say going off on someone like just as a as a as some which is kind of a daily occurrence anyway but you know in terms <laughs> of something that's that's doctored and clearly manipulated if there isn't a, a way to authenticate that video or uh, some kind of indication that that video is ai generated or it's just completely just completely doctored or taken out of the context then that's gonna i think it's gonna be a huge huge problem for the digital space uh, for people wondering, um, what you know, what what do I believe? Um, what what sort of things are true? What sort of things are not? And so, how do you think the AI is going to affect the information space? Shall we say? And is there are there really any policy or alter alternatives or uh, schools of thought that could uh, bring back some kind of authenticity uh, to? our understanding and exposure to politics today and in the future? One of the things I think about technology in general is that it can often magnify things in our society. And I think we often notice the negative things that it magnifies more than the positive things that it magnifies. So what you're discussing with these kind of dark doctored images or doctored videos 
which I think is a real concern, really take place in a broader conversation about kind of misinformation anyways, which isn't necessarily a new problem. I think there are going to be responses to this. I think consumers, readers, people who watch the news do have a desire to kind of weed through a lot of the misinformation. Um, I think we're hitting a point now where people are really tired of kind of these bias and they just want real news, real facts. I think there will be opportunity within the private sector to really develop and step in and kind of take the role of arbiters or for news corporations to really step in and be like, we're going to be a company you can trust. We're not going to do these kind of doctored vid- videos. We're not going to do these spins. And we're going to really stand out on that front. From the policy perspective, I think it becomes more challenging because at the end of the day, you can't legislate morality and people are going to do nefarious things. They're going to mischaracterize people. And if AI is a tool to do that, then they're going to use that tool to do that. So from the policy perspective, I think step one is to wait for an established harm. I think false videos could qualify as an established harm. And then step two would be wait for a policy um, proposal that actually addresses these established harms. And that's something that I haven't um, seen yet. So I guess the advice would be wait to see if systems or processes develop that can really address these issues. And then also wait to make sure that you're not stifling innovation. So you're you're not stifling good innovation because you're worried about bad innovation. So it's kind of a wait and see answer. But as AI is emerging, I think that's the best I I got at the moment. Uh, that, that's a good response. I, I I hope that there's more. You know, it, it's like with if AI can bring about a certain tools that can help detect authenticity. I mean, that's a great thing, and I, I do think that uh, there's a lot of potential there. And uh, it, it's hard to believe that I think it was like back in the 1890s, the there were there were serious considerations of closing the patent office because they didn't think that a lot of new technology was really going to. Uh, come about well. I, 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 you, there's, there's now there's reason to mock the, some of those people now. <laughs> um, so yeah. lesson here uh, from Tears and Me: Don't close the patent office. There's plenty more, plenty more to innovate. <laughs> exactly. And one thing I do actually want to jump in and say again is when we're talking about being able to develop new technology to solve the problems, one of the things I really reference back to, and maybe I'm showing my age because I don't think students today use this, but when I was in school, we would upload our paper through some program that essentially could see if we had copied and pasted it from the internet or taken huge sections from the internet. And I that in the age and the dawn of the computer, specifically of Wikipedia, there was a lot of concern over how are we going to tell if students are cheating or if people are making stuff up. And that tool wasn't perfect. I hear. I always wrote my own papers, but apparently some people didn't. But I think there are going to be emerging technologies that help address a lot of these concerns. Uh, indeed, I, I'm in. I'm in, still at a university doing my doctorate, so it's gonna definitely gonna be something relevant. Especially how, like how does that affect teaching? How does that affect the way that that we disseminate information, all that? And, and yet another lesson, right, about morality, which is don't don't cheat, don't cheat, do it, do it honestly, <laughs> do do the hard work. Um, I, and uh, I I certainly would extend that message from school all the way to DC for sure. Exactly. Uh, let's, so let's now uh, let's look at a little bit of antitrust. Um, and now, first of all, I just want to say, uh, Tears, you're doing a great job just covering all these different issues. I know we're bouncing out on a lot, but uh, I know that this episode is going to be a good uh, platform for further discussion, further specialization in these particular areas. And, and I'm, I'm I'm really interested in working with you on just uh, this finding some more people, perhaps to to, to elaborate more on this. But uh, let's look a bit at antitrust. And I guess one of the the key things, I guess you probably know me already. Now I'm I'm always curious of really seeing seeing again the tension between different uh, different areas of priority. Uh, but when it comes to antitrust, right? There's there's cer- certainly going to be this large debate on on how do you how do you ensure competition but you don't stifle it. 
And uh, I, I guess I like to just ask, especially when it comes to uh, let's if you go back to like social media companies or large or we call big tech is kind of like that informal term. Uh, but uh, how how do you see the antitrust uh, debate moving forward? So I guess instead of just evaluating what is now, how do you see the antitrust debate evolving uh, in the near future? Uh, especially since maybe some people are depending on what side you're on, some people are are kind of impatient as to wondering is Congress going to be able to do anything uh, on this particular issue, especially when it comes to the largest companies like Amazon, Facebook, and other companies too. With regards to big tech, you really see some interesting alliances, I guess is how I will word it. Um, You see people from both sides of the aisle really wanting to crack down on big tech and kind of willing to use whatever tool just happens to be available. Um, A couple sessions ago, we had a bill called American Innovation and Online Choice Act, I believe. Um, And what that one did is it limited um, certain behaviors from companies only if they were over a certain size threshold. So you basically got the big five. I think you got Google, Apple, Apple, Meta, Microsoft, Amazon, and then I think they edited it to include TikTok as well. But you got the big main um, tech companies. And then you saw people like Ted Cruz, who maybe wouldn't traditionally be a fan of this legislation, really coming out and supporting it because it cracked down on big tech. And he was mad at big tech because of content moderation issues. And so you really see this topic, a lot of odd support and desire to just do anything because people are mad at these companies because they're big or because they don't moderate content how they would choose. This is a little bit separate from antitrust, but there is some overlap because when you look at a lot of um, the ICOA bills um, that Amy Klobuchar has and other bills that Amy has been putting out or Amy Klobuchar has been putting out, you see a presumption against size. And she's not the only one who's doing this. There's another bill. It was, I think it was called Tougher Enforcement Against Mergers Act. And what that did is establish a presumption of anti-competitive this threshold. So basically what it said is if the merger is over a certain amount of value, we're just going to assume that that's anti-competitive. So you see this shift in antitrust that is preoccupied with the size of the company or the size of a merger. And this is in contrast to what has been the case um, for the past few decades. If you look into this topic, um, you'll see the consumer welfare standard really thrown around. And while that is not a law, it is a legal tool that has been used for the past couple of decades um, to determine whether or not a company's action is illegal. And essentially, under that standard, if the actions of a company do not hurt the consumer, which is commonly measured through prices, then the action is okay. And so that version of antitrust was really consumer focused and it was really behavioral focused. If the behavior was not anti-competitive, it did not hurt the consumer, then you were good. What you see now is the presumption that simply by being over a certain size, certain companies can be anti-competitive regardless of their behavior. And so that's really the tension that you see playing out Um, within this space right now. Currently, the FTC is bringing a lot of cases. Um, I'm not the only one to point out that they are losing most of these cases. And that is because while the FTC is not embracing the consumer welfare standard, the courts are. And so looking to the future, it really depends on if the courts are going to continue to cling to the consumer welfare standard, which I think they should. Or whether or not the Congress is going to look at the FTC losses and say, okay, we need to tweak the laws so that they can win, which I think will be detrimental to a lot of the consumers. I think economies of scale are real. We can look at companies like Amazon's an easy one and try to imagine how we would have gotten through the pandemic without Amazon and other such companies. So 
I think looking forward in this space, it's really a debate between whether or not antitrust should be enforced through the consumer welfare standard or whether or not antitrust should have certain presumptions against size and continue factors outside of the consumer. Yeah, I, I share your concerns too because it just doesn't seem like a, like a traditional antitrust uh, narrative, as you pointed out. And and my my concern is that this this can be a bit of a like a, an opportunity for for both sides, especially again in a polarized um, in a polarized state of politics here, where you have uh, people on the further right or further left kind of finding that common sort of you know uh, the punching bag, shall, shall we say. Um, and and that's that's certainly very concerning for me. I think I've, I, it's not antitrust is not the only area, but I see it uh, whether it's on maybe on intelligence community, the intelligence community, or just on a lot of institutions, even the judiciary. And here's how we we really gone through a lot of different uh, different topics here, right? I mean, it's kind of like a you know like a not a merry go round, but you know we've it's it's kind of like uh, going through like the buffet line of, of technology issues here. Uh, I, I'm from Nevada, so we love buffets and. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I try to I try to include that. All 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 life is a buffet, right? Yes. Uh, let's talk about uh, some of the so it's really some of the, some of the I guess solutions or calls to action here. What can Americans from all different backgrounds, all different kinds of lives here, uh, they contribute to the larger conversation about these tech issues? Uh, but how do we? How do you see uh, those? You see us and really just everyone here participate in that conversation. I think the sheer success of technology is because average Americans have embraced the technology, used the technology, and like the technology. When we're talking more about like the policy specific space, one of the things, it's an underwhelming action because I'm not going to say go protest, go write letters, go do this, that, or the other thing. Um, but I really do think for better or worse, a lot of lawmakers' primary concerns is getting reelected and they act accordingly. So what the average person can do, and it's unrealistic to do this on every single issue, but to the extent possible, I think educating themselves on the nuances of issues that they really care about um, and then voting accordingly from the local level to the federal level is really the way that we can kind of shift um, the incentives of lawmakers. If lawmakers didn't think that embracing a anti-consumer welfare policy was going to hurt their election, maybe I worded that wrong. Basically, if lawmakers thought that it would hurt their odds of getting elected by doing certain policies, they will not do those certain policies. So to the extent possible, to have an informed voter base is crucial for really changing um, the conversation around any of these issues and around any issue in general, really. And, and how do you see the, the kinds of space when it comes to solutions? Like, what what are some things that you 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 want to see, or things that you are looking forward to when it comes to resolving some of these issues that we've talked about today? I mentioned a little bit about a federal data privacy standard. So I think that's really important. I think taking a light-handed and established harms approach to AI regulation is also key. And while actions by the FTC are more agency and less legislation, I think there is room for improvement. One of the things I would love to see done is movement to really codify the consumer welfare standard. Right now it's a legislator, it's a legal tool, but it's not law. If we or if the lawmakers were to pass a rule or law saying the FTC needs to interpret existing antitrust law through the consumer welfare lens, that would take a lot of the flexibility away and how they decide to pursue their cases. I think there's also areas to clarify the FTC's rulemaking authority. I don't want to jump into another technical issue um, right away, but essentially the FTC has some flexibility with creating some rules. Um, how far that goes or how limited it goes, reasonable people will disagree. So I think that there is room for Congress to step in and create rules that are like, that don't 
pass on their lawmaking authority to the FTC to make sure that the FTC is limited to really procedural rules and not able to pass broad reaching regulations with economic impacts. Very interesting. I, I, I certainly hope that that there's a good balance of of regulatory or I guess rulemaking when it comes to the the executive branch, the legislative branch. That's always kind of an interesting tension there. I am not a regulation person. Uh, I hear regulation. I, I unfortunately I just think of law again. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I just avoid. I just I mean we let, we need laws, but hopefully hopefully not too many of them are going to be written by me because they might not be so good or they might might not face uh, constitutional tests uh, by by the courts. <laughs> so I'd love to give you an opportunity now to talk a little about ACI. So, I mean, we've, uh, you know, I think you've demonstrated so much knowledge and, and of awareness of these issues. So uh, tell us a little about ACI's mission, vision, and just uh, some things that, that you, you feel are, are particularly relevant for yourself and, and maybe just how you fit into uh, ACI as, uh, once again, uh, as the role that you have. Yes. ACI's mission is really to promote consumer welfare by improving the understanding and impact um, that public policies and regulations have on consumers. Um, Our goal is to create a policy and regulatory landscape that promotes consumer welfare um, through actions that reduce costs, improve quality, increase access, and all with respect for the consumer choice. We do this through our policy analysis, our research, um, public testimony, op-eds, and other types of products. One of the reasons I was really drawn to ACI in the first place is this consumer-centric approach to the way that we do policy. I mentioned earlier, I was an anthropology major in undergrad, and so while I love a lot of the economic research that comes out and talks about GDP or talks about kind of these high-level effects, what I really love is learning how that will impact an individual. And I think the more that we can really drive policy discussions to talk about the individual and to talk about how we can respect the differences of individuals through public policy. I think that's really important. And that's one of the really unique things that I like about our work at ACI. And I do that obviously on the tech front, but we have other areas. We do energy, we do healthcare, we do some insurance stuff. So we we kind of hold those values throughout all the areas that we focus on. You guys are really running the gamut here, right? Like, uh, <laughs> uh, which is great. I mean, uh, that we really need uh, again more research and more understanding of these these policy issues. Somehow, find myself connected with with um, the AC, with ACI. I think it was on social media or something. But uh, and I was like, wow, that's that's pretty cool. So, <laughs> so here we are. And uh, and of course, tears that you were kind enough to be on on this podcast. So uh, it, it all all was a happy ending, right? Yeah. Um, thanks for having me. Um, so now let's move on to the last part of our conversation, which is uh, reflecting and connecting these ideas with uh, George Washington's farewell address. And uh, it's really relating to those ideas of patriotism, faith, national unity, uh, education, physical responsibility, and civility. And so these kind of six areas really encapsulate that that speech and those values there. So Tirza, uh, you, based on the conversation we've had today, uh, how, how would you connect those uh, ideas uh, with the areas of policy and issues that we've talked about today? Right now, looking at all of these aspects, um, civility really jumps out. And I think that's really crucial in today's landscape. I mean, it becomes really crucial when you're talking about things like online content. Um, But I think it also is kind of the base for a lot of the other um, aspects that you listed. Um, Patriotism is in part respect for the values that make this country great. And part of those values is the ability to have differences of thought. The same can be said for unity and faith. Um, This country is really diverse and sharing kind of these core values doesn't mean that everyone's going to agree about what that looks like in practice. Um, But I do believe that as long as we can have civil conversations, then we can really find a path forward. The hard part about that is, is that's an individual choice and you can't mandate that. 
but the whole thing about individual choice really brings us right back to one of ACI's core beliefs, which is that we have to respect different consumer choices and the respect for the people that make those choices and live out their beliefs in the marketplace. And also a respect for the marketplace that makes all of those differences possible and allows people to choose. Very well said. I, I, I thought about how voters are are consumers. I mean, we we consume as people. We consume technology. We consume groceries or whatever as we consume information. And uh, I, I really think you've brought a, a, a unique perspective here when it comes to uh, how, how we see, I think, see the world. And uh, I just wanted to wrap up and say thank you so much for, for coming onto the program. I really feel like you've done a great job of going through these major policy areas and uh, and and it, it's, it's as tough as it is to be able to talk about all these in, in a short period of time in one interview podcast episode, I do think that this will be an important platform for future conversations. And I think that's what it's all about is that but just like technology, which never stops evolving, I don't think our minds should stop evolving either. And so, uh, Tirza, once again, I, I, I really thank, thank you so much. And uh, I'll be sure to include links down in the show notes below for people to check out ACI and about their work. But it was really a pleasure to have you on. And, and I, I'm, I'm, I hope we'll stay in touch and that we'll, we'll be able to tackle these issues one at a time. And uh, it's not going to be an easy road, but if it was easy, everyone would do it, right? Exactly. It's, it's been great. Thank you for having me on. Thank you all so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Tirza Duran. Make sure, once again, to subscribe to Friends and Fellow Citizens if you haven't already. Consider joining our Patreon group to support the podcast. We really appreciate all of your support. Once again, enjoy the rest of your week. And remember, a day in America is always better when we are with our friends and fellow citizens. <laughs>